Yo, what's up guys? Alpha, and today I'm going to be doing a full in-depth deck breakdown of a deck that I've recently used to get ranked 2 with on the Arena Ladder. And now before I get into it, there's going to be an MTGA zone link down in the description. If you click on that, you'll have the full deck list there that you can just import into Arena if you want to try the deck out for yourself. Uh, and I'm also in the process of writing a full article about this deck that will have more details, a full sideboard guide, how I would change the deck for best of one, and some tips and tricks to help you play the deck as well. So as soon as that's finished and up, I'll link that down in the description as well. But anyway, with that all out of the way, this is my four-color enigmatic incarnation deck in Explorer. So as the name suggests, this is a deck that is built around this 4 mana enchantment enigmatic incarnation. Now this is a deck that I've been working on for a while in Historic now, I've been working on it for over a year, and it's been such a, a fun card to build the deck around. Uh, I do want to preface this by saying that this deck is pretty difficult to play optimally because you have so many different lines that you can take, it's sometimes difficult to know exactly what to go for. And additionally, the deck has been struggling a lot to beat Corvold, so if you expect Jun Sacrifice running Corvold to be a big part of the meta, this might not be the best choice, but I found almost all of the other matchups to be pretty good, and even the other non Corvold Sacrifice decks have been pretty good matchups. So overall, I've been really liking the deck, and it's been a ton of fun to play as well. But anyway, back to Enigmatic Incarnation. So this is the central card in the deck that the whole deck is built around. And if we have this in play, at the beginning of our end step, we can sacrifice another enchantment, and if we do, we get to put a creature in play from our deck that costs one more than the enchantment we sacrifice. So say, for example, we sacrifice a two mana enchantment, we get to search our deck for any three mana creature and put it into play. Similar if we sacrifice a 3 mana enchantment we get to put a 4 mana creature in play etc. So this is really powerful because it just gives us access to a really sick toolbox to grab whatever creature is just best to get us out of whatever situation we're in. So we'll start off by having a look at the 2 mana enchantments and then we'll have a look at the 3 mana creatures. So starting off with 4 copies of Spirited Companion so this is a 2 mana enchantment creature, so 1-1, one, one, and when it enters the battlefield it draws a card. So this is really important. The way that we're building around Enigmatic Incarnation here is that we want almost all of our enchantments to gain us value when it enters the battlefield, so that we don't mind then sacrificing it. So we're essentially getting a 2-for-1 off all of the enchantments we play. So the fact that this replaces itself when it enters the battlefield is great. The fact that it's a creature is also nice because it means we can start getting him for chip damage and chump block with it against aggro decks as well, which is important. Then we've got 4 copies of Omen in the Sea, so there's a 2 mana enchantment with Flash. When enters the battlefield, scry 2 and draws a card. So this is probably the best of the draw card enchantments we have because we get the additional scry 2. Uh, we can also sacrifice it to its own ability to scry 2. Typically we're not that interested in doing it because we want it in play to either sacrifice to incarnation or blink with Yorian, but if we're in a situation where we have open mana and we don't have either of these cards and we just need to make sure that we're digging to good cards, Getting the additional option to scry to is really nice on this as well. And then we've got four copies of Trial of Ambition, so when it enters the battlefield, the opponent sacrifices a creature. So this is really nice because it gives us access to two mana removal. This is by far the best two mana removal on an enchantment that you can run in the format. You know, the only other real option is Omen of the Forge, which is in red, which is slightly weaker. Obviously, giving the opponent the choice of which creature to sacrifice isn't great, but if you play this on turn two, a lot of the time the opponent will only have one creature in play anyway. And the fact that we do get some amount of creature removal at the two drop slot is really important so Trial of Ambition fills a really important role in the deck for that reason and then we've got four copies of Urban Utopia so this is another enchantment that draws a card when it enters the battlefield uh, it enchants a land and then that land gets tapped to add one mana of any colour so this is really nice because it just helps to mana fix now we are an explorer and the mana base you know we have access to some really nice dual lands so for the most part the mana base is fine in this deck but Urban Utopia you know, there, there will obviously be some situations where you don't have exactly the right mana, especially because we are running some cards that need double mana. So we need double white for Apparition, double black for Ravenous Chupacabra, for example. So Urban Utopia, just ensuring that we have the right colours is really nice. And like I said, it just replaces itself, so we don't mind then sacrificing it to the Incarnation. So let's have a look at the three mana creatures that we can get from sacrificing these two mana enchantments. So starting off with four copies of Moonblessed Cleric. So when this enters the battlefield, we get to search our library for an enchantment card and put it on top of our library. So this is really important because it allows us to dig for the incarnation. The, the ideal curve that we're trying to get with incarnate with Moonblessed Cleric is turn two play an enchantment, turn three play a Moonblessed Cleric and then put incarnation on top of our library and then we can play incarnation on turn four, sacrifice the two mana enchantment and then just start getting value off the incarnation immediately. So Moonblessed Cleric is really nice because like I said, the deck is pretty heavily built around Incarnation, and we're only running 4 copies in an 80 card deck, so I felt like it was important to have a way to search it up. Now the one downside of this is that it only puts it on top of the deck rather than into your hand, which means that the deck does need to be running a very high lands count, because you need to have your 4th land already in your hand in order to make use of this. So that's why we're running a pretty light high land count in the deck. I'll go over that a little bit more when I talk about the mana base. Uh, additionally, it also allows us to run a couple of one-offs that we can shoot her up. So we're running a single copy of Rest in Peace and a single copy of the Meat Hook 
Massacre that we can tutor up off Moon Blessed Cleric, which is nice. And additionally, it has some nice synergy with Incarnation as well, because if we need to search up a Rest in Peace or Meat Hook Massacre, we can sacrifice a 2 mana enchantment at the end of our turn to search up Moon Blessed Cleric off the Incarnation, and then put Rest in Peace or Meat Hook on top of our library to draw for the next turn. So Moon Blessed Cleric is really nice because it just makes sure that we hit on Incarnation in the majority of games, and it also helps to dig for our one ofs as well, which is really important. Then we've got a single copy of Elite Spellbinder, so this is really important at being able to, you know, if, if you're uh, sort of at parity and the opponent's not really pressuring you, you can just get an Elite spe Spellbinder out and see what the opponent has in their hand, tax the most important thing. So this is mainly good against the control and combo decks, you know, especially against control, being able to snipe their counter spells, their Teferis, or against combo decks like Grease Fang, being able to hit up Parhelion to stop them from discarding it, or getting a Grease Fang before they can play it on their turn three is really important. So Spellbinder really nice against control and combo. Uh, Redain, this is another card that's very good against control and combo as well. Um, <clears throat> much much more impactful in Explorer than in Historic because Divine Purge isn't a card in the format. And this is particularly nice against control decks because it taxes Wandering Emperor, Teferi, um, Memory Deluge. And then it's also good against non-creature spell uh, combo decks like Fires of Invention as well because it, in that matchup it taxes their Teferi as well. As well as their Fires of Invention and Transmogrify. So this is really nice to just buy you some time against the control deck make sure that they're not getting their top end off which is very important in the early game and then we come Skyclave Apparition. So this is the only silver bullet that we're running more than one copy of, and that's because in a lot of matchups you do want the second copy of this. So this is very good as just very flexible removal against both creature decks, as well as being able to deal with important non-creature permanents like Witches Oven and Trade of Crumbs against, <coughs> sorry, against the Sacrifice decks, for example. And like I said, we do want the second copy because it does come up quite a lot where you're against a creature deck. You use Apparition to deal with one of their creatures and then they kill Apparition. And if we didn't have the second one in the deck, you wouldn't be able to then search up another one. So I felt like two is important. And we have the third and fourth copy in the sideboard for the matchups where it's good as well. And then we've got four copies of Glass Pool Mimic. So I'm really high on this card. So it's a three mana creature that enters the enter the battlefield as a copy of another one of our creatures. So the really nice thing about Glass Pool Mimic in this deck is it essentially works as copies two through five of all of the one-offs that we're running in the deck. So, you know, say for example we're against a control deck and we use our one-off Elite Spellbinder and it slows their hand down, but we then, we then want to get another one. We can just get Glass Pool Mimic out to copy the Elite Spellbinder. So even though we're running a bunch of one-offs, Glass Pool Mimic essentially works as an additional four copies of those one-offs, which is huge and comes up in a lot of matchups. Uh, additionally, it also counts as an extra land in the deck which is huge because you know like I said with Moonblessed Cleric it's very important that we're running a high land count in this deck so that we can afford to play Moonblessed Cleric on turn three put the incarnation on top of our library and have we, we for that to work we need to have that fourth land in hand already and additionally we have Yorin in the deck as well so we want to be curving out our first five lands as often as possible so Glass will make just working as additional four copies of all of the one ofs and an extra land is really nice. Uh, then we've got a single copy of Callous Blood Mage. So this is a, a, a creature that has flexible abilities when it enters the battlefield, but it's mainly here as graveyard hate. So when it enters the battlefield, we can either create a 1-1, one, one, draw a card and lose a life, or exile a graveyard. So like I said, most of the time we're using this to just exile the opponent's graveyard, which is particularly important right now against decks like Grease Fang, uh, the Phoenix decks, as well as decks running Croxa. So having graveyard hate that we can tutor up off Incarnation is really nice. But the other two abilities do come up as well. You know, if we're against a wide board, for example, and we just need to get a couple of blockers into play, we can bring this out and create a 1-1. One, one. And the 1-1 one, one does gain us a life when it, enters, when it dies as well, which is really nice. And then even if we draw it and we don't need to exile the graveyard, the fact that it always replaces itself due to the draw card and lose a life mode is just really good at ensuring we always get value off it no matter what. And we've got a single copy of Deputy of Detention. So this is here for a few reasons. First of all, it's just nice as, as a catch-all removal spell against any problematic permanent. You know, a lot of the time we will be able to deal with whatever the opponent has with Skyclave Apparition, but there are obviously some bigger cards that Skyclave Apparition can't deal with, like Teferi and Corvold, for example. Now, obviously, that's not ideal to use the Deputy of Detention on those cards, because if the opponent kills it, they get the card back. But just as a sort of last-ditch way to temporarily remove it, Deputy of Detention is really nice, and I have won quite a few games against a Teferi or a Corvold when the opponent isn't able to find removal in time. So just having it as kind of not ideal, but last sort of last case scenario removal is really important. And the other nice thing about Deputy of Detention is it also kills tokens. So we can use this to kill creature tokens off Skyclave Apparition or uh, Fable of the Mirror Breaker or Shark Typhoon. And it also exiles all other tokens with the same name. So say the opponent has hard cast a Shark Typhoon, they have a bunch of Shark Tokens. We can just tutor up Deputy to exile all of them. So Deputy really nice as sort of a catch-all removal 
and also very good at removing uh, creature tokens as well. And then we've got a single copy of Knight of Autumn. So again, like Callous Blood Mages, this is another flexible card. We're mainly interested in the ability to destroy an artifact or enchantment and the ability to gain four lives. So typically, Apparition can deal with most artifacts and enchantments that are run. But Knight of Autumn is generally better to use because the advantage of Knight of Autumn is it doesn't give the opponent a token when you uh, when it dies. So say, for example, the opponent has a Trail of Crumbs. You could tutor up Apparition to deal with it. But then if the opponent kills the Apparition, they get a 2-2 token, whereas that doesn't happen with Knight of Autumn. And then there are obviously see some bigger enchantments and artifacts that apparition can't deal with with you know stuff like shark typhoon bonus's citadel torrential gear hulk for example so having knight of autumn as a way to kill bigger artifacts or enchantments is huge and then the gain for life on this is actually really big as well because one of the downsides of running a four color deck is you do have to run <coughs> quite a lot of shock lands in the mana base so you are going to be dealing a decent amount of damage to yourself throughout the course of the game. And there are a lot of decks in the format that can punish you for stabilising at a low life total, like Burn, any of the Cat Oven decks, um, and then any other deck that can that's running a lot of haste creatures as well. So the ability to cheat this up to gain four life, and then you know we can copy it again with Glass Formic to just keep gaining life. It's just a very nice uh, tool to have in order to put those sorts of games out of reach for the opponent. And then we've got a single copy of Renegade Rallyer. So this is a creature with Revolt, which means it only triggers the ability if we've had a permanent leave the battlefield during our turn. And if we do trigger Revolt, we get to re we get to return a two mana permanent from our graveyard to the battlefield. So this is really nice in conjunction with Incarnation because we obviously have to sacrifice an enchantment to bring the Renegade Rallyer out of the deck, which means we're always going to trigger the Revolt if we bring it out with Incarnation. And this is really nice as, first of all, just a way, if you're at parity, of just ensuring that you get value and you have an enchantment for next turn. So say, for example, the opponent doesn't have anything in particular that we need to deal with, we can sacrifice an Omen of the Sea to get Renegade Rallyer. Renegade Rallyer can then just return the Omen of the Sea, we get to scry to and draw a card so we get the value immediately, and then we have the Omen in, of the Sea in play next turn to get another Incarnation trigger. So Renegade Rallyer is really important in situations where you don't have that many enchantments to ensure that you get an enchantment back to sack for the following turn. And it's also very important in, ad in addition to Trial of Ambition because there will be some board states where the opponent has a big creature that's something like a Skyclave Appar Apparition can't deal with and if it's the only creature they have in play we can sacrifice the Trial of Ambition to Incarnation, get the Renegade Rallyer and then get the Trial of Ambition back in order to make them sacrifice their big creatures. So Renegade Rallyer is also very important at killing big creatures if it's the only creature they have in play. And then finally we've got a single copy of Spark Hunter Massacre. So this is very good against Planeswalkers obviously. Has protection from Planeswalkers so it means it can't be killed by Teferi, can't be killed by Wandering Emperor for example. And then we can pay one to deal a damage to a target Planeswalker. So this is really good at being able to kill Planeswalkers without ever having to attack them. Because Control specifically, the current iterations of the deck are very good at defending their Planeswalkers because they can produce tokens with stuff like Shark Typhoon, Wandering Emperor. They have a lot of removal as well. So Spark Hunter Massacre is great at being able to kill or pick off Planeswalkers without having to deal with them. And then it's also just generically good against Control anyway because we can pay three to give it Indestructible which means it survives stuff like Fateful Absence and the Destruction Wrath effects, which is really nice. And additionally, even outside of control, there are some other decks running Planeswalkers as well, like the Rakdos midrange decks are running Chandra, some of the Red Black uh, Sacrifice decks are running Omnixilus as well. So having access to this off Incarnation is really nice at being able to deal with Planeswalkers against decks that are very good at defending them. Uh, then we've also got um, Oath of Kyra in the deck. It's the only three mana enchantment, but this is a really nice additional removal spell. So when this enters the battlefield, it deals 320 target and we gain three life. Similar to Knight of Autumn, the gain three life on this is very, very strong at being able to stabilize against the aggro decks, which is great. And then we also have a couple of four ofs that we can search off by sacrificing the Oath of Kyra. If got Ravenous Chupacabra, when it enters the battlefield, destroy target creature. So this is very important, you know, it's just great creature removal. But like I said, the deck is kind of soft to bigger creatures, which is one of the main reasons that the deck does struggle against Corvold, because we are kind of reliant on Skyclave Apparition and Deputy of Detention as our main ways to remove creatures. So having access to Chupacabra is great at being able to deal with bigger creatures. And then, you know, similarly, we can also then copy it with Glass Pull Mimic to ensure that we can deal it deal with any other creatures the opponent plays. So cheaper Cabra just great as generic creature removal. And then we've got a single copy of Sh Yashan as well, which is here pre predominantly for the Sacrifice decks. Now this is really strong game one because a lot of the time the Sacrifice decks, unless they're running Binding of the Old Gods, won't have a great way to deal with Yashan, so you can sort of just steal it game one. And even against the Corval decks, like I've said, that is the main deck that this, this deck struggles to beat. 
But rushing to Ishan can be an effective way to actually beat Corvold. The main times I've managed to beat Corvold is when I've managed to get Ishan into play before, you know, tutor up an Oath of Kai with a Moon Blessed Cleric, get that into play, sacrifice it to get Yashan down, and then even if the opponent does play Corvold, they're only going to be drawing one card a turn off the Corvold trigger because they won't be able to sacrifice anything else. So Yashan is really good at just giving you an edge against the sacrifice decks and giving you a way to beat Corvold. So if you're against the Corvold deck, your general game plan should be just to race to get Yashan out as soon as possible if you can. Uh, then we've also got a single 5 drop in Elder Gargoth. It's important to have a single 5 drop in the deck because if you have two copies of Incarnation you can sacrifice one to the other to get Gargoth out. And I think Gargoth is definitely the best 5 drop to be running. When I put my deck list out of this, <coughs> my previous builds of Incarnation that I was running in Historic, I got a lot of questions asking me why I'm not running Yorian as the 5 drop. And the main reason is because with Incarnation <coughs> Sorry, you're going to be sacrificing all of your enchantments anyway. So by the time you actually sacrifice to get a Yorian out of the deck, you're not really going to have many enchantments left in play to blink with it. And Gargoth is just a card that is great at stabilizing. It's great when you're at parity, and it's great when you're ahead as well. So at every point in the game, Gargoth is great. Loads of decks are going to struggle to deal with this because most decks aren't running just generic creature removal. They're kind of specific stuff like Fatal Push, Skyclave Apparition, or whatever. So a lot of decks really struggle to... Uh, to deal with Gargaroth once it's on the battlefield. And the other really nice thing about Gargaroth is, since it's non-legendary, we can copy it with Glass Pulmer Mix. So a play that I quite commonly do, if I do have two copies of Incarnation and a two-mana enchantment as well, is with the first Incarnation trigger, you sacrifice the other Incarnation to get a Gargaroth in play, and then with the second Incarnation trigger, you sacrifice a two-mana enchantment to get a Glass Pulmer Mix, copying the Gargaroth, and then you can keep getting Glass Pulmer Mix out of the deck to copy Gargaroth and build up a board, like a whole board of just Gargaroths, which is so hard for a lot of decks to beat. So I really like Elder Gargoth at the top end of the deck, and it's won me a lot of games, especially in conjunction with Glass Pulmonic. And then we've also got Yorian as the companion, so in general I'm not a huge fan of Yorian in Explorer. I feel like for the most part, decks like Control, you're probably better off just going 60 cards and running more consistently. But I really like, well, I think Yorian is just really necessary in this deck because I've tried 60 card enigmatic incarnation decks in the past. The main two issues that always come up with that deck though is you run out of tooth targets way more often. So obviously one of the downsides of running a 60 card deck is you don't have as many tooth targets which makes the incarnation makes the incarnation itself weaker. The second big problem is you're much more likely to draw your tutor targets as well, which is pretty bad. You know, a lot of the tutor targets are quite situational. You don't really want to be drawing Spark Hunter Masticore against an aggro deck. And specifically, a card like Renegade Rallyer is significantly worse if you draw it because it's actually quite difficult to trigger Revolt without Incarnation in play. So you don't really want to be drawing your one ofs And in a 60 card deck, you're going to be drawing them quite often. And then that, compo that compounds the first issue as well because if you're drawing your tutor targets, then you're going to run out of tutor targets way more often. So you don't really have room in a 60 card deck to fit everything in. And the other really important thing about Yorian is it always gives you good top end. You know, you're not always going to have access to Incarnation. But the way the deck is built, you're going to be running enchantments that gain you Enter the Battlefield abilities. We want to be running creatures that also have a lot of Enter the Battlefield abilities so we get value off the Incarnation immediately. And that pairs perfectly with the blink on Yorian. So the great thing about Yorian is even if we don't draw Incarnation or Moonblessed Cleric or the opponent thought seizes it away or something, we always have access to a top end. So we can just play our enchantments, get the Enter the, enter the battlefield abilities, play our creatures, get the enter, ba enter the battlefield abilities, and then we can just blink them all with Yorian, which in a lot of situations is just good enough to win the game on its own, even without having to get incarnation. So Yorian, really important part of the deck. And then onto the mana base, we've got 34 lands in the deck, uh, plus the 4 glass pulmon mimic, which is the equivalent of just under 29 lands in a 60 card deck. But that's, like I said, that's really important to ensure that we can rely on Moonblast Cleric putting Incarnation on the top of our deck and being able to cast it. And this is also a deck where if you miss your land drops, you just lose the game. And we have a lot of insurance against Flood as well because we have Yorian. You know, even if we flood out with like 5 or 6 lands, that's actually pretty good with Yorian because we want to be hitting our 5th land on time in order to be able to blink the stuff that we uh, get in play in the early game. So, that's felt really good. Overall, I've been really impressed with the main deck. Uh, I ha quickly, I have made a couple of changes to the main deck since the gameplay. So I've got five matches that I played on the ladder so you guys can see the deck in action in a little bit. I have made a few changes to the deck. I was running Rafine in the deck as just a generically good three mana card, which was decent overall, but I felt like uh, here it is. I felt like with Moonblessed Cleric and Renegade Rallyer as sort of just generic cards that you can pick up, we didn't really need Rafine. And so I've moved Redain into the main deck to make room for Unlicensed Hurst in the sideboard that I'll get to in a little bit. 
Uh, but anyway, that's the main deck. It's felt really good to me. Uh, now onto the sideboard. So we've got copies two through four of Rest in Peace, which is really important, especially against the Grease Fang decks. You know, as you can see, we're not running any instant speed removal, so we're relying on Graveyard Hate in order to win that matchup. So having four copies of Rest in Peace is really nice. And generally, you know, Rest in Peace isn't a card that you really want to be running in multiples, but I think in this particular deck you can afford to because we're running Enigmatic Incarnation. So even if we draw multiples of Rest in Peace, we can just sacrifice them to the Incarnation to get more creatures out. So we don't really mind drawing this in multiples as much. Then we've also got copies 2, 3, 4 of Meat Hook Massacre. So this is very important against creature decks, aggro decks, uh, and any decks where we also want additional life gain. Uh, the really nice thing about Meat Hook Massacre is we can use it as a board sweeper. And then once it's on the battlefield, it actually counts as a 2 mana enchantment itself. So we can then sacrifice it to Incarnation to get 3 mana creatures out. So again, it's a card that we really don't mind drawing in multiples. And the matchups where it's great, we want to see it as often as possible anyway. Then we've got 4 copies of Destiny Spinner. So this is predominantly here for the control decks, any sort of counter spell decks in general. So, you know, Mono Blue Spirits, any any tempo decks as well, this is great. So giving all of our creatures and enchantments uncounterable is huge. Uh, very important at being able to resolve our incarnation. And if we can resolve incarnation against a control or tempo deck, that's usually going to be good enough to win the game on its own. Uh, don't forget about the activated ability on this. We can just make a land really huge and then use it to attack down planeswalkers if we have a bunch of enchantments in play. And it's also an enchantment creature itself. So if we do, if, if we really need to, we can also sacrifice it to incarnation in order to get a three mana creature, which is huge. Uh, then, like I said, I've made a couple of the, uh, changes to the sideboard since my gameplay. I was originally running Forbidding Spirit in the sideboard, which is a card that's very good against go wide aggro but i felt like with just four rest in peace in the main uh, in in the sideboard and main deck that the grease fang matchup was quite tough so i've made room for additional two copies of unlicensed hearse pretty much exclusively for the grease fang matchup just so we ha we're we're pretty likely to have the graveyard hate in order to shut off the most impactful part of their deck and then we can pretty easily beat their backup plan if we can resolve a rest in peace or unlicensed hearse and then finally we've got a couple copies of skyclave apparition just for the matchups where it's good like any of the aggro decks against creature decks against the sacrifice decks and being able to deal with witcher 7 and trade of crumbs just having the additional third and fourth copy here is really nice so that's the deck it's been so much fun to play i absolutely love playing incarnation decks um, um, next up, I've got uh, five matches uh, that I played on the ladder, so you guys can see the deck in action. If you've got any questions about the deck at all, drop me a comment, and I hope you enjoy the gameplay. Big up. Okay, sweet. Here we go. Okay, so we're going first here. Oh, we can't keep that. Can't keep a one lander. Oh, wow. Okay. Definitely can't keep this either. Oh, wow. Come on. <laughs> like to have a hand with more than one but less than five lands. So we obviously have to mulligan this. You can't keep a one lander and you can't keep a five lander either. Okay, so we got to keep this. Sucks mulling to four on the first game, but is what it is. So we'll put back the glass pool mimic because we have enough lands and we kind of want that in the deck to hit off incarnation anyway. I think we only need three lands and I think... I'd probably go for Chupacabra over the Meat Hook Massacre here, because Meat Hook Massacre isn't really a card that we're going to be playing in the first few turns of the game. Whereas Chupacabra, we're happy to play on turn 4. Ha, ah, okay. So it looks... If I had to guess, I'd say we're against Control, which, with our current hand, we're not really very well set up to beat. So I think here, you know, we have to start applying some amount of pressure... Even though we would love to save cheaper car bread to kill a creature, if we're up against a control deck, that's not going to happen until they have a Wandering Emperor in play, or they uh, cycle a Shark Typhoon, by which point it's probably too late. So it's important to get a creature in play here, I think. So I'm going to attack here first because... Oh, they, they missed a land drop as well. I was going to say, I was kind of concerned about the Wandering Emperor, but looks like they're struggling on mana a bit here. So I think... The only real way we're going to win this game is by start applying pressure here. So I'm just going to play Oath of Kai now. Ideally, we would like to save this to pick off a Planeswalker, but I don't think we're really in a much like of a good shape to be able to do that. I think we have to get quite lucky to win this game, considering we mold to four. So, wow, okay, it looks like the opponent missed the land again. So we just need to start applying as much pressure as possible. The downside of this is it probably means the opponent has a completely stacked hand, so I'm going to play Yorian here. I didn't want to play it last turn because of Jorari Disruption and Sensor, but yeah, I was going to say, if they have a full hand and they're missing land drops, they're very, very likely to have a counter spell there, so yeah, we do need a lot of luck to be able to win this game. Huh, okay, I mean, Spark Hunter Master Core is pretty good. So we'll attack here first. Okay, so we do get to resolve the Master Core here, which is pretty sick. 
Um, but we are now completely out of cards in hand. Now there is an argument here to potentially holding up mana to uh, give the Spark Hunter Massacre indestructible if they have a Wrath of God or something, but I think it's more important to just kill the Wandering Emperor here, because if we don't kill it, they're just going to be able to make a 2-2, which they're going to be able to then chump block with, so... So, I mean, we do have, you know, Spark Hunter Massacre is very, very good against Control. The only downside is it can be exiled by Farewell and March of Otherworldly Light, but if they just have Destruction effects, Spark Hunter Massacre can just win the game on its own. So, this could be the, the card we were hoping for, you know. This could ride us out to victory, but... Yeah, I mean, they do run a decent amount of Exile. I mean, the good thing about it as well... Yeah, okay, so they do have the March, which is a bit annoying, but... The good thing about uh, Spark Hunter Masticore is, since it has protection from Planeswalkers, it can't be exiled by the Wandering Rem uh, Emperor either, so... Uh, okay, so we do Urban Utopia into Urban Utopia here, which is decent, you know, we would love to still have Yorian to be able to blink all this, but if we do manage to resolve an Enigmatic Incarnation now, we're going to have a ton of stuff to be able to sacrifice. So we don't want either of those. Glass Pulmic, I think at this point, since we have six lands, we're interested in using the Glass Pulmic to copy something could set a stop during the upkeep to scry but I think we need to you know if we do that we only have access to three mana here okay they have Teferi so we really need to draw something good this turn really to have a standard chance but yeah like I was saying okay that wasn't what we wanted but yeah if, if I set a stop during my upkeep to scry there we only have access to three mana which isn't good enough to pay for something like an enigmatic incarnation I, I like just seeing what I draw first there because say we scry and we see an enigmatic incarnation on top, we miss the opportunity we've missed the window to cast it when they only have two mana available at that point, so Okay, so they untap with Teferi. Okay, and they cast memory deluge, so yeah, I mean I'm pretty sure we've lost this game, but I'm gonna see what we draw, one more draw step. So we'll sacrifice the Omen of the Sea now, so then we have our full mana available for next turn. Definitely don't want two lands. Let's see what we draw for turn here. But yeah, if we don't draw anything good, I'm just gonna concede. Okay. Yeah, yeah, that's not good enough. So that was a bit unfortunate. We did mulligan to four, though. If we'd had, you know, anything else to apply pressure, that game could have gone differently. So, sideboarding here. Definitely want Destiny Spinner. Definitely want Redain. Don't need Yashan. Don't need Rest in Peace. Don't need the Meat Hook Massacre. And we've just got two more cuts to make here. So out of the three mana creatures, what can we afford to cut? I mean, to be honest... Hmm. We could trim on Skyclave Apparition, but... I think we can probably just afford to trim Trial of Ambition instead and just keep all the other three mana creatures in because we are bringing in two Destiny Spinner, oh sorry, four Destiny Spinner which increases the number of two drops that we're playing so, and Trial of Ambition, you know, it can be decent in certain spots against Control but only really for clearing the way for us to attack Planeswalkers, it's not a card that we really want to be drawing in multiples really so I think trimming two Trial of Ambition makes sense and then we do have a lot of good three mana creatures in this matchup so if we can resolve Incarnation, we have Elite Spellbinder to tack something in their hand. We have Redain, which is really good at slowing their top end down. It's, it, it delays them playing Wandering Emperor, Teferi, Memory Deluge, any of their Wrath effects. Uh, then we've also got Spark Hunter Mastercore, which is, you know, obviously casting it from our hand last game where you have to discard a card to cast it isn't great, but if you tutor it up off the Incarnation, you don't have to discard a card. So, you know, say you have Incarnation in play and a few mana available, you can just put a stop during your end step, cheat up the Spark Hunter Masticore, and then just kill the opponent's Planeswalkers before they draw, just by using the the destru like the deal one damage part of it, so going into game two, I feel like, you know, obviously last game, it, it, if we'd had a seven card hand, we'd have obviously had a much better chance, but going into game two, I think our chances go up quite a lot, especially because of Destiny Spinner as well, that's a card that if we can get to resolve, to, get to resolve it on turn two, and then we can force through all of our other plays. It's very difficult for them to, to beat unless they have something like a Fateful Absence immediately. And if they have to use something like a March of Otherworldly Light, they have to pay three to deal with it in the early game, which then taps them out, which then gives us a window to play stuff. So, yeah, I think Control is probably one of the matchups where the way the deck is built, we have a lot of weaker cards uh, game one, but post-sideboard, 
I like our chances a lot better. Okay, so I think we can keep this. You know, having two glass pool mimic isn't ideal, but they essentially work as lands in case we miss land drops. And then once we do get creatures in play, it's pretty decent as well. Okay, that was a sick draw. So we can slam Destiny Spinner on turn two here, which, like I was saying before, is huge because now we can just force through our other plays. They kind of need to have Fateful Absence on turn two here for them to favorably trade with our exchanges here. So we'll attack first here. We don't really have to worry about anything. You know, if they have Fateful Absence, it doesn't really matter if we attack or not. When it gets to turn three, that's when we need to start considering not attacking because of the Wandering Emperor. Uh, I'll keep Manor open for the Omen of the Sea here. We want to kind of dig for lands. You know, Glass Pulmonic can act as a tap land if we want, but we do want actual lands because we would like to get Yorian into our hand at some point because the really nice thing with Destiny Spinner... Ha, huh, let me think here, actually. We definitely want the land. I'm not sure we want the Spirited Companion since we already have one in hand. But yeah, like I said, with Destiny Spinner, the really nice thing is it makes our Yorian uncounterable, which is really good because that can just completely swing the game because we can just blink all of our stuff and get value immediately. Moonblast Cleric is a very nice draw here. I'm definitely going to play that because we can then put the uh, Enigmatic Incarnation on top of our library and then since we have Destiny Spinner in play the opponent isn't able to counter it and if we can resolve an Incarnation against Control unless they have a March of Otherworldly Light to deal with it immediately that puts us in a great position so... Ha, okay, they do have the removal spell for Destiny Spinner which does make things a little bit more awkward here because that signals to me that they probably have counter spells, otherwise they probably wouldn't use it immediately there. So we're pretty incentivized not to just slam the incarnation next turn. I think we need to bide our time a little bit. I'm going to lead on attacking first because if they get greedy and just flash in a wandering emperor to save themselves the damage, we can then resolve the incarnation. Since they didn't, I'm just going to run Spirited Companion out here and then put Yorian into hand. And then that incentivizes them to keep holding mana up for counter spells. Okay, so the fact they waited till their end step to to flash and wandering emperor makes me believe they probably do have a counter spell in hand, unless they were just bluffing, which they could, could they could be. So they attack him with a three three. That's not too much of an issue. Okay, thankfully native fairy is great to see. So we have quite a few options here. Since we have a second incarnation, we could just try gemming the first, but I'm not sure that's really the best line here. We could glass polemic. We could attack with the Moonblessed Cleric. We could Apparition the Wandering Emperor. I think I'd like going Glass Pulmonic here because even if the opponent has a removal spell, we still get to copy one of the creatures and either is great. But the ideal thing we're going to try and do here if they don't use a removal spell is to copy the Moonblessed Cleric and then put a Destiny Spinner on top of our library. Okay, sweet. So we get to a Playing Glass Pulmonic when you only have a single creature on the battlefield is super risky. I, I don't advise that if the, if the opponent's playing a, a deck with instant speed interaction in, but... So that resolved. That's all good. And now we can play Apparition to deal with the Wandering Emperor. And now next turn, we have the mana to go Destiny Spinner into Incarnation, and then it's guaranteed to resolve here. Ha, huh, okay. So they have a second Wandering Emperor, so... Hmm, I'm not sure... We could have attacked first there, but then they could have blocked and we wouldn't have been able to copy the Moonblessed Cleric. We could have saved the Skyclave Apparition because Wandering Emperor wasn't doing that much, but then they can just keep making tokens repeatedly, so... I'm not really sure what the perfect line was last turn, but... Now we've got Destiny Spinner, I'm pretty happy to just jam the Spinner here, because even if they have a counter spell, they kind of have to counter the Spinner, which then allows us to resolve the Incarnation. And then with Incarnation, we could either Deputy of Detention their tokens to get rid of them, we could Apparition the Wandering Emperor to get rid of that. We could Elite Spellbinder their hand, or we could get Redain into play, which I think is probably my choice here, because that will stop them, you know, at this point we're very worried about Farewell and Depopulate, as well as Teferi, obviously. And the danger with going for Elite Spellbinder is, if they have multiple of those cards... Oh, okay, they have March. So that kind of sucks. We still have, thankfully, have the second incarnation to try it again next turn, but... Yeah, like I said, I think the advantage if Incarnation resolved there of going for Redain is the danger with going for Spellbinder is if they have multiple good cards in their hand they can just play the second one. You know Spellbinder is a card that is much better earlier in the game and Redain is better catch all especially if the opponent has a full hand. So okay I was gonna say next turn I'm not quite sure what to do. Since they're attacking here I'm definitely gonna block with the Moonblessed Clerics because they're you know they're not really going to be able to cleanly attack through if they keep them back as blockers, and we don't want to unnecessarily take damage here. Okay, drawing Redain is very nice. 
I think I'm just going to slam the incarnation here though. Because if we can get that into play and start getting value off it, that's really strong. We're going to crack the clue here first, just in case we draw a land. We want to be able to play it. Okay, nice. And then I think we're, ha we're probably going to sacrifice the Spirited Companion, because that's an enchantment that will just die if the opponent has a Wrath effect. So I would rather use that before the Omen of the Sea, in case they Wrath the board, and then we still have the Omen of the Sea available to use later in the game. Ha, huh. okay, they have the second march. That's a bit unfortunate. But we still have Destiny Spinner in play, which means that we can resolve the Yorian, which is pretty huge. So we won't block here, obviously. I'm happy to take the three damage. Okay, our land is nice because now we can play Redain and Yorian. And getting to resolve Redain means that if they have Depopulate or Farewell, that'll take them off that. Because Farewell, when we have basically nothing going on, is a real issue. And this will just completely take them off that. And the other really nice thing about Redain against this sort of build of control is that it also taxes March of Otherworldly Light unless they exile cards from their hand to pay for it because if they're just paying with mana they uh, it costs them four and Redain taxes any spell that costs four or more so we'll blink those three you know it is a bit annoying that it gives them a four four but I think we're, we we want to deal with this Wandering Amber before it makes any more tokens Ha, okay, Spark Hunter Massacre, I think we kind of have to keep that because we want a way to be able to kill Teferi if they sweep the board and then play another Planeswalker here. Okay, so they just pass here. So we definitely want to get Massacre into play and since we have Redain, I'm not worried about Farewell. If they have Depopulate, we can give Spark Hunter Massacre Indestructible, so I'm not too concerned about that. Now we'll attack first here just to see what they have. Okay, so they do have the Wandering Emperor, which is a bit annoying, but we can kill that immediately with, this, with the Master Core and still have enough mana to give it indestructible in case they have Depopulate as well, which is really important. This is what you get so we get him for two, we'll play the Master Core, and I think since we can kill the Wandering Emperor here and Skyclave Apparition, the only real reasons we want it is to be able to deal with Narset and Wandering Emperor. And we already have a Master Core in play to be able to deal with them. I think I'm happy doing that. We could play the Rallyer here since Yorian's left the battlefield. But yeah, we only have a Destiny Spinner in the graveyard. So I think I'm going to hold on to the Rallyer here. Hold open three mana so that we can give Master Core indestructible if uh, if they do use Depopulate. So huh, how much mana have they got? They're getting close to be able to cast um, Farewell here. Which is a little bit annoying. But we thankfully we drew Incarnation which is huge. So we could... Spellbinder, so even if they have Farewell, we can just get rid of it. Because at that point it would be taxed to, what, 10 mana? Okay, they Deluge, which is great. That means we get to resolve the Incarnation here, which is huge. And the other great thing about having Redain in play is even if they had March, it would cost them... Oh, wow, sick. Yeah, if they had March, they would have to pay 6 mana with Redain on the battlefield, so... So that felt a lot better. I think we're happy to just run it back without any changes there. Um, yeah, I don't, I don't think we, we want anything else from the sideboard for this matchup. So we're on the draw here. And yeah, this looks pretty good. The annoying thing is we don't have any green mana for Destiny Spinner, but we have Omen of the Sea to help us dig for it, so... I'm happy to keep this, and we're kind of just hoping that Omen of the Sea gets us there in terms of hitting a green land. Knight of Autumn is another card that isn't, you know, it's not great in the matchup, but... Oh, wow, okay, we drew a green land off the top, that's great. But yeah, it's very important at dealing with something like a, a Shark Typhoon if they hard cast it. And, you know, absolute worst comes to worst, we can play it as a 4-3, which is a decent beat stick. And additionally, you know, some control decks are running Search for as Counter as well, so I think Knight of Autumn is, is worth it. You know, you want to have a good answer to hard cast Shark Typhoon. Because I have had multiple control decks just hard cast it when we have Incarnation in play. So here, I think it's probably worth playing around Sensor and Drari Disruption. Because Destiny Spinner is probably the most important card in this matchup, so getting it to resolve is huge, and it does, which is great. Okay, so they flash in the Brazen Borrower. Ha, ah, okay. So we've got quite a few options here. Playing Rafine is pretty nice, but I really don't want to attack with this Destiny Spinner. 
because they could have the Wandering Emperor. Playing Rafine and then attacking with Destiny Spinner and it getting exiled by Wandering Emperor is pretty bad. So I really, I, I don't want to be attacking with Destiny Spinner. If we play Apparition here, we get to get rid of the Brazen Burrow, which means the opponent basically just can't race us, which is huge. And then we can attack, we can play Rafine the following turn and then attack with the Apparition and start conniving and getting extra value off it. So like I said, I'm not going to attack here. Plus, oh wow, okay. Maybe we can attack then. I was going to say, I'm not going to attack here because of the Wandering Emperor, but the opponent just cycled sensors so they don't have mana for the Emperor anymore. Actually, thinking about it, that might have been quite greedy because if they'd had Fateful Absence, they could have killed the Apparition and got a 3-3 token and blocked with it, but Arena kind of gave away they didn't have anything because it skipped straight through there. Ha, huh, okay, so Moonblast Cleric is interesting. We could play the Cleric and put uh, Incarnation on top of the deck, but I think we just want to start applying pressure here. You know, it's... The, the opponent can play to fairy and defend it next turn, so I think it's just more important to get start getting bigger creatures on the board, start getting value off the Rafine here. And then we can still flash in Omen of the Sea to make use of the rest of our mana as well. Ha oh, well, the Ottawa the Apparition, interesting. So yeah, like I said, same same thing as last turn. I didn't want to risk attacking with Destiny Spinner in case they have Wandering Emperor, or if they have a kill spell for Apparition. Ha, ah, okay, they do have Teferi here, which is a little bit annoying. So we would love to draw a Trial of Ambition or Deputy of Attention to deal with this 3-3 here, because then we can potentially just attack and kill Teferi off the Destiny Spinner and the Rafine. Ha. Ah, do we want Omen of the Sea? I don't think we really want either of those. Oh wow, okay, that was a sick draw. So we can now Deputy of Detention the 3-3 token, and then as long as we just discard two non-lands off the connive, we should be good to kill Teferi if they don't have any removal spells here. Which is a big if, they very well might. But we'll see. I think we want to target Rafine here because... Oh wow, we hit Incarnation as well. So since we've drawn Incarnation, I think we're going to discard the Moonblast Cleric, and I think Apparition probably has more value than Knight of Autumn. Knight of Autumn, like I said, is only really good at killing Hardcast Shark, Typhoon, and stuff like that, so... Wow, so that went through, that's huge. And now we can just put Yorian into hand here as well, and then we can play Incarnation next turn, hopefully. So, that was pretty huge. The fact that they didn't have any removal there, and that we drew uh, Deputy Detention was pretty huge. We still had decent plays without, but not being able to kill Teferi this turn would have been problematic, I think. I am a bit worried about that Field of Ruin. Okay, they killed the Destiny Spinner, huh? Yeah, I am a bit worried about that Field of Ruin because we've drawn our only basics. So they could essentially Stone Rain us, but... Thankfully they haven't been doing that so far. So, huh. Well, we would love to discard non-lands to buff the Deputy of Detention. I think since we've drawn so many lands here, we're incentivized just to pitch them, because we do need to have a decent amount of action in our hand as well. I'm happy to keep the Triomes just as, uh, as ways to cycle, because we have got quite a lot of lands here. And then I think I'm just going to try and jam an Incarnation here. They could very well have a counter spell, but... At least this way we can s we have mana to then cycle one of our lands away. I mean, again, we could have played Yorian and still had mana to get the treasure, but... I like trying to go for Incarnation first there, because if it resolves, we can Redain or Spellbinder their hand. And if it doesn't resolve, we still, you know, we still have Yorian, which... In a way, is kind of a better card if we can resolve it, because it closes the game out a lot quicker. So, we'll cycle our land away here. They only have one card left in hand, so... It kind of needs to be a counter spell. I, I'm going to, even though we, we have another incarnation, I think I'm going to go for Yorian here. Just to start closing the game out. Oh wow, it was a counter spell. Okay, that's a bit unfortunate. And then, since we have incarnation, and we've got, you know, two potential draws off these treasures, I think I'm going to play the Rafine's Tower here. Oh wow, okay, Gargaroth. So now we can play incarnation and Gargaroth next turn. Oh, come on. Why do they always have to ferry on top of the deck? But I mean, to, to be fair, they do need to have... You know, we have two huge plays that we can make this turn, so they kind of need to have drawn a counter spell. Because we can Incarnation here. 
And then we still have mana to cast Elder Gargoth as well. So do they have a counter spell? I mean, if they don't, I'm trying to think what the best card to pick here is. We could just copy the Gargaroth, but then we're kind of screwed by a board sweeper. You know, we could get Glass Wormwick to copy the Gargaroth, which if they don't have a board sweeper is usually going to be good enough to win the game. But I think that's too risky. I think we're better off trying to set up for next turn. So we could go for Moonblessed Cleric to put a, an enchantment on top of the deck, but I think I prefer going Renegade Rallyer here. Or we, we could also go for Spark Hunter Master Core, but again, that plays very poorly against a Wrath of God effect. So I think I'm happy just going Renegade Rallyer, getting an Omen of the Sea just to draw us a card, and then we have a guaranteed, even if they have a Depopulate, we have an enchantment on the battlefield to be able to use with Incarnation the following turn. So... Let's just pray they don't have a farewell here, and just hope they don't draw into like, e even if they draw Depopulate, since we use Renegade Rallyer here, we still have a reasonable stuff in play to come back with. Okay, nice. Okay, so we're going first here, and huh. I mean, this sounds pretty reasonable apart from we don't have green mana, but I think I think this is a reasonable keep because we we still have both Rafine and Oath of Kai to play on turn three, and we have you know three or four turns to find green mana for Yashan and then Gargaroth. Okay, Duress. So we do lose the Oath of Kai, which is a bit annoying. Imagine we're against <coughs> Red Black Midrange then. A bit strange to have Duress in the main deck, but I guess they're targeting something specific. Oh, they're Arcanist. Okay, that makes a bit more sense. So, even though we'd love to play Rafine here, we can't really afford to because that will give them a target to duress with their Arcanist. So, we're just going to play Trial of Ambition and then shock in the... Uh, sorry, just play the Temple Guard and unshocked here. And then, depending on what we draw, we could just play Yashan to guarantee we have our fifth land um, for Gargaroth, which is pretty huge. And it's going to be difficult for them to attack past a 4-4. You know, most of the creatures in the Red Black Midrange deck, especially the Arcanist version, which is probably a little bit more fragile, they're going to be 2-2s two and 3-3s, three you know. Stuff like, you know, Fable of the Mirror Breaker tokens, Graveyard Trespass, a Blood Tithe Harvest, this sort of stuff. They're not going to be able to attack past Yashan. And if we can slam a Gargaroth, you know, some of, some of those decks are running stuff like Bedevil and Heartless Act, but a lot of them aren't, so... Okay, so yeah, I think we're just, even, since we didn't draw a land there, I think I'm happy to just play Yashan here. Search the basic planes out of the deck, and then, yeah, it's going to be quite difficult for them to attack past here. Had we drawn a non-creature instead of the Deputy of Detention, there is some argument for playing that instead, because then it gives them fewer targets for Duress, but... Okay, Croxus, so they're playing quite a graveyard-heavy... Arcanist deck by the looks of things. Kind of reminds me of the old school historic versions. Ah, okay, they have Fatal Push, that makes sense. But yeah, this version of the deck looks like it's going to be quite vulnerable to Rest in Peace, which is a good thing. Okay, so they're presumably not going to duress it. I mean, we'd, we'd be very happy if they did, but they know all three cards in our hand. They know they're non creatures. If they had played the duress there. Oh, well, ugh, I'm an idiot. I thought we had two green there. Ha. Huh. I mean, we still have decent plays here. We can still play Rafine and Spirited Companion. But yeah, we would have been happy if they did Duress last turn because that's a card out of their grave... One less card in their graveyard for Croxa. But yeah, I think we're happy to play Rafine here. Actually, hmm. Thinking about it, I probably should have played the Spirited Companion first just to see what we drew because, you know, had we drawn like an Oath of Kaya, we could have been incentivized to use that instead of the Rafine there. So that was a bit of a misplay. Ha, they do have a Thought Seize. So that makes things awkward because that takes us off Gargaroth and it also means that we can't really afford to put Yorian into hand while they have a Thought Seize in the graveyard. Okay, they have a Blood Tithe Harvest. So yeah, I don't think we can afford to put Yorian in hand here, unfortunately, but we do have Rafine that can connive. So hopefully that can loot one of these lands away and draw us into something good here. We can't really afford to attack with the Spirited Companion here because they'll just obviously block it. Okay, Companion's a decent draw. I think we'll discard the Godless Shrine because we already have enough black sources, I think. Hi, okay. So, I mean, it is kind of annoying flooding out, but 
Worst case scenario, if we do keep flooding out, if we hit 8 mana, we can put Yorian into hand and play it in the same turn to play around Thoughtseize here, which is really important. You know, I, I really don't think we can afford to put Yorian into hand, because they will just immediately attack with the Arcanist and <coughs> strip it with the Thoughtseize. Actually, thinking about it, I'm going to set stops during the opponent's turn, because I want them to think that we have something so that they're more incentivized to use their Thoughtseize before we put Yorian into hand. If they go to combat and they see that we have something, they might be incentivized to attack with the Arcanist um, and use the Thoughtseize before we put Yorian into hand. Although now they've... I mean, that was a weird time to use Blood Tithe Harvester, so I assume they're going to use Fatal Push. Yeah, yeah. So they do kill the Rafine here, which is a bit annoying, but they did burn their Blood Tithe Harvester on a Spirited Companion, which is a pretty good exchange for us, so... And they're stuck on three lands as well, so they're not that close to... Well, I mean, they're obviously one land from Escaping Croxer, but the fact they use Fatal Push means that's a single less card in their graveyard to escape Croxer with. Ah, okay, so I mean another land generally isn't great to see here, but now we have enough uh, now we have enough mana to be able to put your into hand and cast it next turn, which is pretty huge. Definitely going to set stops during the opponent's turn again because I want them to think that we have something so that they then use thought seize because they've got five cards in graveyard at the moment. Oh wow, I was expecting them to crack the blood token. I was really worried that they're going to crack the blood token and then escape croc, so and we don't really have a good way to stop that, but. Wow, we got them to use the Thoughtseize. That's huge. Okay, so setting the stops paid off there. Because now Thoughtseize is out of their graveyard. I mean, it didn't really matter because we can Yorian and Blink it anyway, but that's now one less card in their graveyard, so they're further away from escaping Croxer as well, which is huge. So even in the sea, you know, that's a nice that's a nice pickup, but we're just slamming Yorian here. That's going to be really difficult for them to deal with, and we get to kill one of their creatures and draw a card here, which is pretty huge. And the fact they're stuck on three lands is pretty important for us as well, you know. But yeah, them using Thoughtseize last turn was so important because had they not, they would be able to escape Crocs and now if they drew their fourth land, so... So yeah, that was pretty huge. And two Omen of the Sea is great because we can just filter through our deck now. Make sure that we're hitting gas because we have enough lands to play basically anything that we draw. So two Graveyard Trespasses is a little bit annoying, but... We have the Yorian here to block it, even if it goes to Knight. Oh wow, we got Incarnation. Okay, sick. So Incarnation, if we can resolve this game one against Red Black Midrange, it's going to be so hard for them to win because they're not going to be running Feed the Swarm in the main deck and they're not going to be able to outgrind Incarnation either. So we'll sack Trial of Ambition and I think we'll just get rid of the Croxer here. It's been threatening us for a few turns and... Even though we can shoot up Skyclave Apparition to deal with it, we still have to discard a card when it enters the battlefield. So we're just going to get Blood Mage now to discard it. Thinking about it, I, it probably was better to sacrifice an Omen of the Sea, considering we have a second one in hand, because they can exile Trial of Ambition from the graveyard with the Trespasser. Thankfully they go for Gargoth instead, but we want to have a Trial of Ambition available for if we go for Renegade Rallyer, so it probably would have been better to sack Omen of the Sea instead. Okay, Trial of Ambition off the top is nice. Wow, okay, so now we have a bunch of stuff in play. Yeah, we'll keep getting... So my plan here now is, since we can Trial of Ambition one of these Trespassers, we can kind of now afford to attack with the Yorian and then use the Incarnation to get a Glass Polemic to copy the Yorian and then just blink everything. And if we choose to keep the original Yorian, we can then blink everything again at the end of the opponent's turn. So, even though we're going to get attacked for th for 6 and they can potentially deal an extra 2 off the trigger, that's nowhere near enough for lethal and we're going to get so much value off this Yorian Blink, so I think this is definitely the play. The way it works, since we're doing it during our end step, we won't get our stuff back until the opponent's end step, but like I said, we can afford to take 8 damage here. I'm going to blink the Incarnation as well, just in case they do have a way to answer it. Okay, yeah, nice. I was going to say, that's going to be so hard for them to beat. So here, typically against the Red Black mid-range decks, I'm not super high on Rest in Peace, but since they're running Arcanist and Croxa, I think Rest in Peace is way better against this particular version. So we don't need Yashan here. We don't need... Mm, maybe we want Master Core. They could be running stuff like Chandra, I'm not really sure. Since we're running Rest in Peace, I think we can cut Renegade Rallyer, because if we have Rest in Peace in play, Rally is just not going to be able to do anything. Hmm. I'm not sure... I'm <sighs> 
Probably don't need Meat Hook Massacre, honestly. I think I, I like always keeping one copy in against creature decks so that we can tutor it up with the Moon Blast Cleric if we need to. Deputy of Detention and Masticor, I think I'm happy to cut. And Knight of Autumn as well, you know, they could be running Fable of the Mirror Breaker, which is important to be able to kill, but... Yeah, I don't know. Um, Masticor is one that I might regret cutting, because Chandra Tortured Defiance can be difficult to kill. They usually play it and then minus. And being able to then search out Masticor and just pay one to kill it is very important, but I think there's a decent chance they're not running it if they're playing more Arcane version, so... But thinking about, I don't know, maybe it's better than the fourth copy of Apparition. So this I think we can keep. You know, like I said, Incarnation is one of the best cards in this matchup. And we have Moonblast Cleric to search up any enchantment as well, so... Okay, they duress the incarnation, but we can shoot her up again with the Moon Blessed Cleric, so that's not a huge issue. So I think we can afford to play one of these glass form mixes of land, but since we already have uh, our fourth land other than that, I think we're going to try and save the rest of the glass form mix. Okay, so they duress again. Don't hit anything, thankfully, which is good. Okay, they have Arcanist. That's a bit concerning. So we can move this cleric here, and this is a tough choice. Normally you want to go for Incarnation, but I think here, I, since they already have an Arcanist in play, and they're running Croxa, I think I like going for Rest in Peace, and then we can always copy the Moon Blessed Cleric with Glass Pulmonic to search Incarnation later if we need. So Blood Tithe Harvest Harvester is a little bit annoying, but had we had a 2 mana enchantment in play, I think I would have much preferred going for Incarnation instead of Rest in Peace there, but since we didn't have an enchantment, I think just getting Rest in Peace in play is very important, because it completely shuts off the Arcanist, and will shut off any Crocs as they have later in the game as well, which is really huge. You know, with our hand as it is, we don't have great ways to beat Crocs at... Oh wow, 6 mana Chandra, okay. So I'm not going to block here because... I want to use the Glass Pool Mick on the Moon Blessed Cleric. Okay, Spirited Companion is nice because it now means that even if they are sandbagging removal, we still get to copy the Spirited Companion even if they remove the Cleric. Okay, so they don't, so we can copy the Moon Blessed Cleric. And now we have enchantments in play, I'm very happy to go for Incarnation here instead. And I quite like that sequence as well because it basically stabilizes us from getting picked apart by the Arcanist. Oh wow, go blank, okay. Hmm. So I mean, we're definitely pitching the glass pool mimic, I think. I, I, it's too greedy to keep Rafine as well, because we don't actually have any black mana in play. I think we just have to pitch the, the glass pool mimic and the Rafine here, because we don't actually have black mana. And we do want to keep hitting our land drops so that we can put Yorin into hand and use it as well, so... Okay, they attack with the Blood Tithe Harvest, and now I'm very happy to trade. Now I've already got value off the the glass pool mimic. Now we can just go for incarnation. And then we can attack with the moon blast cleric. And then we definitely want to sack the spirited companion. Just trying to think what we want to get here. Probably elite spellbinder. Because they are stuck on three lands. They could have four mana Chandra. They could have Sorin as well. So Oh wow, okay. Hmm. So, you know, typically when they have two of one card, you usually want to take the other one, but they're two mana away from Glorybringer. And even if we, you know, Chandra is a problematic card, even if we kill the first, we don't want them to have access to a second one. So I'm thinking I'll probably take one of the Chandras here, and then if they don't draw a land, we can just copy, we can tutor up Glass Pool and make to copy Elite Spellbinder and take their second one. Because, like I said, if they play Chandra and kill one of our creatures, we then have to deal with the second one anyway. Okay, sick, we got there. Okay, sweet, so we're going first here. And yeah, this looks decent. Obviously we don't have green green mana for Yushan yet, but we can play everything else. We have Omen of the Sea to help us dig for more lands and everything, so... Got Trial of Ambition. 
Uh, we don't have the second white for apparition either, but like I said, Omen of the Sea is really nice at being able to dig for lands here, so... So definitely going to lead on the Glass Pool Mimic here, as a land. And then even if we do whiff on the Omen of the Sea, we have our... We can play our, our third land untapped if we need as well. So we'll see what the opponent's on here. Okay, Hive into Thoughtseize. So that could be a number of things. Could be Red Black Midrange, could be could be any of the Grease Fang variants as well. More inclined to believe it's probably Rakdos because most of the Grease Fang variants I've seen since they're three colours can't really afford to be running Hive, but <clears throat> we'll see. So we're going to play the Goddess Shrine here, just in case we hit a white land off the Omen of the Sea. We might want to play Apparition next turn. The fact they took Trial of Ambition makes me think they probably have a creature they want to resolve this turn. Ah, okay. Interesting. So with the Omen of the Sea, we're basically just looking for any green or white land, or just any land in general. Ha. Huh. I mean, Oath of Kai is pretty good here, but I think we're mainly just interested in lands. We want to make sure that we keep hitting lands until we can play even Yorin at the top end. Even though we're looking for lands, I'm happy to keep Omen of the Sea here, because that's a way for us to dig for lands this turn. And I'm going to play the Omen of the Sea during the main phase, just in case if we hit like a tap land off this, like a Triome. I want to be able to play that for land this turn, and then we can play... Okay, we do hit a green land, which is great. Then we can play an untapped land next turn. So had this been like an Indartha Triome or something like that, we could have still played Watery Grave untapped next turn and play Yishan or whatever the case may be. So we'll play the Breeding Pool here just in case if we hit a white land, we might want to play Apparition and then we could play Yishan without having to pay two to shock in the Watery Grave uh, the following turn. So Bone Crusher Giant, so yeah, I'm pretty confident this is just Red Black Midrange. Yeah, Graveyard Trespasser, so. Definitely looks that way. So Oath of Kai is a nice draw here, but I think Yashan is really nice because it ensures that we hit our land drop for next turn. It ensures that we hit the second white source for Apparition, and it's also going to be hard for them to attack past as well. You know, one of the ways that Red Black Midrange can win is just if it pressures you on the board, so getting an early blocker down is huge to stabilise. Okay, another Thought Seize. So... I mean, there's an argument for taking all of these cards. It'd be interesting to see what they take, because if they take a, the Masticore, it's a pretty heavy signal that they have a Planeswalker in hand. I guess Apparition and Oath of Kaya, they're not that scared of, because... Oh, well, okay, they take the Oath of Kaya. Interesting. I was most concerned about them taking Moonbless Cleric here, because that stops us digging for Incarnation. So I'm pretty glad they didn't take that. Okay. A land this turn's great, and we're not even that bothered it's a tap land, because we weren't planning on playing two spells this turn anyway, so... Like I said, I'm pretty glad they didn't take the Moonblast Cleric with Thoughtseize, because now we can just tutor up the Incarnation, and that's going to be very difficult for them to beat, unless they have, you know, main deck feed the Swarm or something, which they're very unlikely to have. Okay, so they only pitch one card, which means they must rate whatever, they, whatever else they've got in hand. Well, they attack with both. That's in I mean, my guess would be Bone Crusher Giant, but you know, if they've got Ember Cleave or something, I might be in trouble here. Okay, so I imagine this is Bone Crusher Giant then to kill the Ashan. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Otherwise, that attack just didn't make any sense. Okay, they cast the Bone Crush Giant, which I'm pretty happy to see, because we can just resolve the Incarnation here. And we could kill the Bone Crusher Giant with an Apparition, but I think we're more incentivized to just take out the Fable here with Knight of Autumn. I mean, we could also Elite Spellbinder if we're concerned about their hand, but I think, you know, like I said, the main way you lose against the, the Rakdos decks is if they start applying too much pressure on the board, so I think it's more important to take out their creatures first. So I use Knight of Autumn, cleanly take out the Fable. The, the downside of going for Apparition on Bone Crush the Giant there is if they have a removal spell for it, they just immediately get a 3-3 creature back. So you're not really getting that far ahead on board, really. Huh. 
cut. They thought sees again. So I imagine they take the apparition here. Yeah. Which is quite awkward because we, if we want to cast the Masticle, we'll have to discard whatever we draw for turn. Ha, okay, Gloss Pool makes not a bad draw here. Because now we can put Yorian into hand to use for next turn. We can Gloss Pool make the Knight of Autumn, make it a 4-3 so it can cleanly trade with the Blame Crush Giant here. And then, you know, like I keep saying, the way to play against Rakdos is just to make sure they don't overwhelm me on the board. So I think I'm pretty happy just getting an Apparition here to take out the... Probably the Blood Tithe Harvester, because... First of all, if the Apparition dies, it'll only give them a 2-2. And second of all, they can start killing our creatures next turn with the Blood Tithe ability. Which is quite scary when they potentially have a second Bone Crusher coming down this turn, so... So I'm pretty happy with things as they stand. We've got Yorian ready for next turn. Okay, they attack, so we'll definitely trade here. We don't wanna we don't want them to get in for damage unnecessarily because, you know, like I keep saying, oh wow. That seemed like a bit of an early concede from the opponent, but I guess if they didn't have a good answer for Yorian, that'll be it for them. So here I think Meat Hook Mask is pretty good here because you know, like I said multiple times, the way you lose this matchup is if you let them overwhelm you on the board. So Meat Hook Massacre is a great way to just mop up all their like fable tokens and blood and you know, especially graveyard trespass is quite difficult to deal with with single target removal. Just trying to think what to cut here. Spark Hunter Master Core is an interesting one. I think we probably want to keep it in because they're very likely to be running Chandras. And a lot of people, you know, are, we are playing kind of a control ish deck as well. So I think people are likely to be boarding in Planeswalkers if they don't have them in the main deck. Blood Mage could be a cut. Huh, I'm not really sure. Because they could be running Crocs, so they could be running Planeswalkers. I think I'm happy to cut Rafine here because we have some generically powerful cards already. You know, Moon Blessed Cleric and Renegade Radia both work pretty nicely as generic cards. Now we could regret cutting Masticor or Blood Mage if they're running plain, like a lot of Planeswalkers or they're running Croxa, but I think Apparition is probably just a better catch-all because that can kill, you know, the reason I'm not too bothered about keeping Masticor in is because unless they're running something really random, I think the, all of their Planeswalkers will be four mana value or lower, so Apparition can take them all down anyway, you don't really need the Master Core. And Blood Mage is only really great against Croxa, and Croxa can be killed with Apparition as well, so that's kind of my rationale for cutting those two cards. Okay, Blood Tithe Harvester. So, I think to ensure that we have double white for next turn, I'm going to play out the Watery Grave and play Urban Utopia on it, just so that we can play Apparition next turn if we need. Oh wow, okay, Incarnation off the top's great. We just need to try and dig for more lands. This is the sort of hand where I'm very glad I'm running a very high land count in the deck, because if we weren't, then it becomes very difficult. You know, if, if you start missing land drops at this point, you fall way far behind, which is one of the main reasons I'm very high on running a higher land count. So we'll definitely Oath of Kaya here. I think running out Apparition is probably a little bit greedy because if they kill the Apparition they immediately get a creature back so they get way ahead on tempo and if they had Chandra playing Apparition you, you'd no longer have a clean answer for it. Ha, okay they do have Croxus so maybe taking out Blood Mage was a bit of a mistake but either way since they since we've drawn the incarnation naturally. I'm pretty happy discarding the, the uh, cleric here. I mean, we could have used the cleric to get rest in peace, but they're pretty far away from escaping Crocs as things stand, so I'm, I am i don't mind pitching it. Plus, we're looking for lands here, really. We want to keep hitting our lands, so using cleric to make rest in peace the top card will just mean that we likely will be missing land drops for the next couple turns, which isn't what we want. You know, especially with Yorian, we want to keep hitting lands even past our fifth land, really. Okay, so they do have a Bone Crusher for the Apparition. But we've got Incarnation in hand. We've just got to really hope they don't have Thought Seize this turn. Ha, okay, they do have Chandra. But, like I said, we can, we can cleanly kill that with Apparition off the Incarnation, so... I'm not too concerned about that, really. I am a little bit worried that we're down to 9. That is fairly low, but... So, we'll sack the Urban Utopia, get Apparition here to deal with the Chandra. Now the downside is that we will give them a 4-4 token if this Apparition dies, but we do have Deputy of Detention 
as a fetchable card off the incarnation to just exile them. So I think it might look a bit weird trading here because we're giving them a 4-4 but we have, like I said, we've got the deputy in the deck and again, you know, like I keep saying, the way I've lost this matchup in the past is just letting them outrace me on the board because they do have decent reach in the late game as well. Ha, huh, okay. Go blank is a bit rough here. I think we have to discard Spellbinder in the Spirited Companion. We definitely want to keep a 2 mana enchantment to be able to get Deputy of Detention. Or well, I guess we could use Oath of Kai to get Ravenous Chupacabra, but I like keeping Urban Utopia over the Spirited Companion here because they can kill the Spirited Companion before the Incarnation resolves. You know, we're just giving them a target for their Fatal Push otherwise, so I prefer Urban Utopia here. I think I, I prefer putting Yorin into hand. So. I think here, actually thinking about it, we're probably better off sacking the Oath of Kai to get Chupacabra because that's the only 4-drop we have in the deck and this is a fairly good spot to pick it out whereas using an Urban Utopia to get Deputy of Detention, you know if we do it this way round we could get a Glass Pulmonic to copy a Chupacabra or a Renegade Rallyer to get an Urban Utopia back like we have much more utility of our 2-mana enchantments especially now we've cut Yashar and so I think getting Chupacabra out there makes a lot of sense. Okay, Fable. So just gotta hope they don't have Thoughtseize again. Wow, they don't, okay. So this is a pretty easy Orion turn here then, I think. We can just blink the Chupacabra and the Utopia, kill the 2-2 token, and then we still get an Incarnation activation as well, which is pretty huge. And then I think with the Incarnation activation, we're probably interested in going for Knight of Autumn to kill the Fable here because they could potentially discard two cards off the Fable which will then enable them to escape Croxa. So we, we want to kill the Fable, like once it turns into Reflection you kind of have to kill it anyway because it will run away with the game otherwise. So I like doing it here because it stops them getting extra cards in their graveyard to enable them to escape Croxa. So yeah, just checking there wasn't anything else better, but yeah, we'll just go for Knight of Autumn, kill the Fable here. And then, you know, Glass Pulmonic is pretty nice here because we can blink, we can copy the Yorian, which then we can blink Chupacabra and Knight of Autumn twice with. Okay, sick. Okay, sweet. So we're going first here, and yeah, this looks pretty decent. You know, we got Cleric to dig for Incarnation, we got Spirited Companion to hopefully draw us into a blue source. We already have enough mana to cast, oh wow, we got blue source already, sick. And we can already cast everything else in our hand, we already have double white for Apparition and white black for Oath of Kaya, so... And yeah, drawing the fourth land there was huge, because now we can go for Moonbless Cleric to search up Incarnation, and we already have the land in hand to play it already, which is huge. Huh, so Rafine is interesting. We could play Rafine pre-combat and start attacking with the Companion, but I think it's more important to get Moonbless Cleric and just tutor for the Incarnation here. You know, that's the, the whole thing the deck's trying to do, so... And against... Ha, huh, okay. I was going to say, it looked like maybe they're playing Control, but since they've tapped out here, we're definitely going to take the opportunity to play Incarnation. Um, going to be sacking the Spirited Companion, which would leave only the Moonbless... I mean, we could attack with the Moonbless Cleric, but we probably want to keep a creature back to be able to block the 2-2. The we don't want to let them keep attacking him for free treasures, and if they had a removal spell, we don't want them to just, you know, kill our Knight of Autumn and then be able to attack in and start generating treasures, so... I think out of the two, I'd rather block with the Moonbless Cleric because there's a chance we might want to copy the Knight of Autumn if they play another Fable of the Mirror Breaker, for example. Or we could even copy it to kill that treasure token if we're worried about them ramping. I guess we could we could get Deputy of Detention instead, but... Ha, huh, okay. Prismari Command, so... Not 100% sure what the opponent's on here, really. Lead on the Spirited Companion, just in case we draw something better. I mean, ha, huh, we, we, we probably should have played our land first, because then we'd have had the option to play Rafine, but I think I like putting Yorian into hand here, just to give us the option to blink the Spellbinder. So definitely go for Spellbinder here, just to see what the opponent's doing. Ha. Huh. Okay, that's pretty scary. 
So they only have Prismari Command, they can play off the Gearhulk now. Now typically Shark Typhoon is one of the best hits for Spellbinder because it stops them cycling it and basically makes it uncastable, but since they have Sublime Epiphany and Gearhulk, I'm inclined to take the Gearhulk here. Sublime Epiphany itself I'm not too bothered about, but them flashing in Gearhulk and getting back Epiphany and then making a copy of Gearhulk and getting back something else, that's going to be so hard to beat. So I think we kind of have to take the Gearhulk here. Um, and again, Sublime Epiphany is a powerful card, but just them using that on its own isn't too bad. So I think getting rid of the Gearhulk probably makes the most sense there. So we have a lot of options here. I think I like attacking first, potentially, or I don't know, actually. If we get Rafine out here, that might bait the Epiphany out, which I'm actually alright with. If they use Epiphany, they could bounce the Incarnation and counter Rafine, which is a good ch exchange for them, but... They have to sacrifice both treasures, which puts them back down to four mana. And I think I'm pretty happy with that exchange overall. We do lose Rafine and we get they get rid of Incarnation, but we don't actually have another enchantment in play to use with the Incarnation anyway. So I don't mind that because those treasures were problematic. They could have hardcast the Shark Typhoon. They could have got to a point where they can pay eight mana for the Gear Hulk. So, so I think I'm happy to attack first here. They're probably going to... Oh, okay. They don't flash in the... Brazenboro, which is interesting. So, makes me believe they probably have a counter spell. I'm going to shock in a land just to play around Mystical Dispute here because they could very well be playing it. It's not worth risking. Okay. So, they shock Typhoon for one. That means they're probably digging for a counter spell, which is a good sign. Oh, okay. So, they have Make Disappear. They made the 1 1 just to give it casualty. So,. They do counter the Incarnation, which is a little bit annoying, but I think at this point, since we're so far ahead on tempo, you know, they're already down to 11, we have a Spellbinder in play. I'm happy just using Oath of Kaya to deal 3 to them. They're down to 8 already, I don't think this kind of deck is going to have a lot of life gain. And we have Yorian that can blink the Oath of Kaya, which will deal another 3, so... I think, you know, we are essentially against the tempo deck, so we want to try and outrace them. If we give them time to get up to Gear Hulk, they're going to be able to Gear Hulk flashback that epiphany so we, we we kind of need to be playing a bit more aggressively here i think so we'll attack first they can just block with the brazen borrower but i just want to make sure they don't have a bunch of mana available to counter the yorian here so again i'm going to shock my lands and just to play around mystical dispute okay sweet so now we get to play the yorian again you know maybe it was correct to just play the yorian without attacking there but i want to take them off i, w I want to give them less access to mana, you know, they could have had another Sublime Epiphany, they could have had like a Syncopate, they could have <coughs> used Growth Spiral to dig for another counter spell, so I think it was fine attacking there, even though we did lose the Spellbinder, because it it plays around more counter spells, it plays around them having an answer for Yorian, so and now since this did resolve, Oath of Kai will put them down to 5, and then we have Trial of Ambition and Apparition to deal with any creatures that they try to use to block it with so again, I think it's really important, you know, if we play slowly, it's just giving them more time to get up to the 8 mana that they can then cast Gear Hulk with. And like I said, Gear Hulk plus Epiphany is going to be so hard to beat, so. Okay, so they have a 2-2. Two, two. So we'll attack here, we'll put them down to 1. Looks like they're thinking about something here, though. Wow, they bounced the Yorian. I mean, that's a bit of a show of desperation because we can just blink the uh, the Oath of Kaya. So, I mean, since we know they just have Growth Spiral, I mean, technically it's probably correct to just blink the play the Orion to blink the Oath of Kaya because it plays around more counter spells, but since we know Growth Spiral is the only card in their hand there, it doesn't really make a difference. So they Growth Spiral here, hit a land, which is good. I mean, it's, wait, how, how close are they to Gear Hulk? One, two, three, four, five. Wow, so they can Gear Hulk here. Wait, do they have enough mana? Hold on. They do, right? Gear Hulk costs 8. 
which is potentially problematic. I mean, they can bounce the Yorian with the Sublime Epiphany, but we can just replay the Yorian to kill them with Oath of Kaya here, so... I guess Epiphany doesn't just win them the game at this point, and they, <coughs> they don't have anything in the graveyard they can use to kill Yorian with, so... Yeah, so if we hadn't had this Oath of Kaya in play, they could have just flashed in the Gear Hulk and bounced the Yorian, but they can't afford to do that here because we can just replay the Orion and blink the Oath of Kaya to deal lethal. So playing that Oath of Kaya earlier was huge. You know, just dealing three directly to them, that's going to make the difference in this game, I think. Because they, they basically need to find a fire here. Because they, they can't afford to bounce my Yorian because we can just blink the Oath of Kaya, like I said. I think we'll apparition the, the Fable here. Just in case they draw a good uh, a creature that's good to copy. So again, yeah, I'm so happy I played that Oath of Kaya a bit more aggressively because had we not and they'd been at five, they could have very easily just flashed in that Gear Hulk last turn and we'd have been pretty far behind on tempo at that point. Whereas now they don't, th again, they need to like draw another Brazen Borrower or some other flyer because I don't think Team uh, Flash, which is what it looks like they're playing, I don't think their deck is going to have any ways to gain life. Okay, so they they copy, or they, they cast the Epiphany from the graveyard. Again, they can't afford to bounce Yorian or the Oath of Kaya here, so they bounce Yashan. I guess they're just digging for answers, yeah, yeah, they're going to play Prismari Commands. Probably create a treasure and draw two discard two, I'd imagine. Oh, they deal two, okay. I mean, I guess, I was going to say, I guess they have enough mana off Nissa. They can, they've still not used the Nissa Plus, so they still have an extra two mana available. So they've got one, two, three, four, they've got six mana available if they still have a Nissa on tap. Which they do, okay. So we go down to 17. So if they have another Brazen Borrower, that's going to be annoying. Um, if they have basically just any way to kill Yorian or to block in the air. Okay, they big score. They're still digging by the looks of things. Growth Spiral. I mean, they could still hit Brazen Borrower, I guess. Okay, sick. So that was close. Had they been a little bit quicker on finding the gear, well, finding the lands to play gear hulk, that would have been problematic. So definitely want Destiny Spinner, definitely want Redain. Um, what else do we want to cut here? So we want the Spark Hunter Master Cord to be able to kill Nyssa. Don't want Yashan. I mean, we could. That does stop them sacking their treasures, but that's super narrow. Um, what else? Could maybe trim an apparition here, but that is useful at killing stuff like Brazen Borrower, so I want to keep at least one in. And one more cut here. Hmm. I mean, we can probably cut a Spirited Companion because we're bringing in Destiny Spinner as like an extra four two drops, so we can probably afford to cut another two drop. But yeah, overall, I think, you know, Tempo can be difficult, but Destiny Spinner is such a good card against the Tempo deck, so it just completely shuts off most of their game plan. So this is a decent keep. We've got Early Interaction, we've got Incarnation as well. So we'll lead on the Triome here. And just going to Omen of the Sea here. want to keep hitting land drops is the most important thing. So we'll flash in Omen of the Sea. Again, just looking for lands here. You know, we do have Glass Pool Mimic that we can play, but we want to keep hitting lands. Hmm. I think we can bottom the Triome and keep the Godless Shrine. I think keeping untapped lands when we have a Glass Pool Mimic as a tapped land already is, is quite important. So I think I'm going to play the Moonblessed Cleric here. 
And we could we could either search for Incarnation to have a backup in case the first one gets countered, or we could search for Destiny Spinner here, which I think is probably the more appealing target, just to shut off their counter spells. Ha, ah, okay, they're just flashing the creature side of Brazen Boris, so they're trying to get aggressive here, which makes sense. So I'm going to attack here first, and then I'm going to shock in the Goddess Shrine just to play around make disappear. They'd have to sacrifice the Brazen Borrower in order to counter this. Okay, they got Mystical Dispute. That's fair enough, but we can at least try to ambition the Brazen Borrower to stop them racing us now. Ha, they play Fable of the Mirror Break is sure. Wow, and nothing else. So we get to resolve Incarnation here, unless they have Spell Pierce. Which they could do, but I think, you know, we're not going to miss the opportunity when they're almost entirely tapped out. So we'll sack the Trial of Ambition here. We could either go for Knight of Autumn to kill Fable, or we could... Elite Spellbind is definitely a consideration there, but I think killing Fable before they get the loot off is really important, because it just stops them getting a better quality hand, essentially. And again, I think I'm happy to block with the, the Moonblessed Cleric here, because... We're much more likely to want to copy the Knight of Autumn, I think. Wow, they got Gargoth. Well, they're going to be pretty unhappy to see Trial of Ambition. That's such a good exchange for us. <laughs> I mean, either way, we could have sacked another enchantment to get Renegade Rallyer to bring back the other one, but... So we'll just sack the Trial of Ambition here and get a Spellbinder, I think. We could get Redain, but I think with four cards in hand and only four lands in play, we're happy to use Spellbinder here. Interesting. So, I mean, we have... Uh, actually, we since we drew Renegade Rallyer, I think we have to take the Gargoth here because we don't have a clean answer to it. If we had Renegade Rallyer in the deck, we could sack Omen of the Sea to get Rallyer and then get back Trial of Ambition to kill the Gargoth, but... Uh, they have Make Disappear, so I don't think we're going to run out Yorian just yet. Because Yorian blinking everything would be sick, but... We don't want to give them a target for their counter spell. So, let me think here. I'm, I'm definitely going to get Glass Formic to copy the Spellbinder. I would normally sack Spirited... Okay. Yeah, I'm just going to copy Spellbinder and then they're dead the next turn anyway, so... Okay, sweet. Um... Yeah, I think this hand is reasonable. We don't have green mana for Urban Utopia yet, which is a bit of an issue, but we can play all the other cards. Callus Blood Mage can just draw us a card if uh, if we don't have anything else going on. So, oh wow, okay, we drew the green hand anyway, which is great. So we can Urban Utopia. I'm going to target the Watery Grave here. Okay, another Oath of Kaya. See what the opponent's on here. So Steam Vents could be a number of things. Could be Phoenix, could be Control. Gonna run out the Blood Mage here, and if it resolves, just draw a card, I think. Okay, so that resolves. Spike Field Hazard, huh? I mean, like, my, my initial thought is Phoenix, probably, but I'm still not 100% sure yet. Okay, they pass again. I think I'm just going to put Yorian into hand here. You know, we could play Oath of Kyra out, but that doesn't really seem very effective. I'd rather just get Yorian into hand so that we have the option to play it next turn and we can blink the Urban Utopia, which is nice. Okay, so they're on Jeskai. And um, Maze Mind Tome, huh? So they could very well have Sensor or Jari Disruption, but I don't... If we are against... First of all, we don't really know if we're against Control for sure. And second of all... We're probably not going to get much better of an opportunity to cast it anyway. You know, like I said, it could have been pretty annoying if they have Dry dis Disruption or Sensor here, but if we wait, we're just giving them more time. And if we are against Control, we can't afford to just do nothing, so. Okay, so they paid it. I still don't really know what we're up against. I assume it's some, some form of Control, but I'm not really sure what yet. 
But either way, getting Yuri into play is pretty huge here, I think. See the truth, huh? So that's interesting. That's normally part of... I don't know. I don't know what that's from. The only card I've played to see the truth in is like Collected Conjuring and Historic. I assume they must have some way to cast it from the graveyard. I don't know. Either way, I think I'm just going to play Yashan here. Um, just trying to think whether it's worth playing Drown Catacombs first just to play around Make Disappear. I mean, it probably is. Because I think at this point we might be interested in using this Triome to cycle it anyway. And the only advantage we'd get of not playing the Catacombs is to play the planes so that we don't give away the other Catacombs in hand, but that's such a small thing, I don't think that really makes much of a difference, but it resolves either way, and now we've got them on a two-turn clock if they don't interact with either of these creatures, so... But yeah, I still, I still really don't know what we're up against here. Okay, Ottawara... Badrock, okay. So, mutate, I guess? I mean, we'll definitely, like, we have to kill this thing as a priority, so I'm gonna lead on Trial of Ambition here. Hopefully they don't have a protection spell. If they have a way to phase it out or something, that's gonna be annoying. Okay, negate, that's fine, because we can just use Oath of Kaya now. And we, we also have the mana to play around Spell Pierce, which is pretty huge. So... Annoyingly, Mutate is a deck that I don't have any experience with myself, and I've barely played against it either, so I really don't know how to play this matchup. I think, in general, I'd probably just have to ensure that I apply pressure and have ways to remove their creatures. It's probably the best I can do with, with this deck, but... And now, annoyingly as well, we don't have them dead on board because they can just activate the Maze Mind Tome to gain four life, but they're pretty close to dead, and we have two Oath of Kai's in hand, so we could potentially use both of them to finish the opponent off here. Okay, another Vadrock. So we'll flash in the Omen of the Sea. Let's see what we hit. Oh wow, Incarnation is pretty nice. We'll definitely keep that. Don't need another Triome, we already have enough lands, and we have a Triome in hand already. So I think we'll lead on Oath of Kai to try and kill this Vajrock here, see if they have another counterspell. Okay, sweet, that resolves. And then we'll attack. And if they just tap the Maze Mind Time to scry, that'll probably tell me that they have a counterspell. Okay, well, they don't. So they just gained four life. Um, hmm. So we can either Oath of Kaya, but I think, you know, Oath of Kaya gets countered by Spell Pierce, whereas Glass Pulmonic, they need to have uh, uh, main deck Mystical Dispute to stop it. And now, since we keep the original Yorian, we blink everything, and then when things come back during the end of our turn, we can deal three off the Oath of Kaya and then blink everything again. Yeah, okay. We blink everything again, and then Oath of Kaya enters again during the opponent's end step, which will kill them. So. Huh, this is the downside of playing, of not knowing what to do in certain matchups, you know. I have no idea how to sideboard here. I imagine if they're built around using Vadrock to cast stuff from the graveyard, that Rest in Peace is probably good. I'm going to cut Spark Hunter Massacre as well because. I don't know. We didn't see any Planeswalkers. I, I think we just want to have Removal and Graveyard Hate here, maybe. I don't know. Maybe we want some Destiny Spinners as well. I mean, this is the problem. I guess this is this is the disadvantage to not having knowledge against the deck, and also the advantage from my opponent's side of playing more of a fringe deck. They're going to have a real advantage post sideboard just because I don't have a clue what I'm doing in them in this matchup. But from what I've seen of the deck, when I've seen it played in standard, the most important thing is to just kill their creatures as quickly as possible. But and I imagine rest in p if if they're looping stuff in the graveyard, rest in peace is probably good. Blood Mage, I Blood Mage is difficult to know because I I won't know when is right to exile the graveyard. And since we're already bringing four rest in peace, I'm probably going to trim trim the Blood Mage anyway and see. 
But yeah, I'm, I don't really know how the combo works. I think they run Vadrock. I think they just keep looping cards from the graveyard and start making treasures and then buff the Vadrock until it's lethal. But again, I, I've only seen the deck in action maybe two or three times in event coverage, so I, I really don't know. Let's just hope that uh, our hand lines up well against what they've got. Okay, so lead on Spikefield Hazard. Um, I think we'll lead on the Triome. As things stand, I think we're probably interested in cycling at least one of these Triomes, because we already have five lands, so... Okay, they've got Maze Mind Tome. Okay, Apparition's a nice one, because now we have an answer to Maze Mind Tome and to Vadrock as well. So we'll lead on the Urban Utopia, just to make sure that we have Double White going into next turn. I mean, we already have Double White with the Temple Garden anyway, but... Okay, they scry with the Maze Mind Tome. Okay, and Fable. Okay, that's a nice draw. So since we drew the Incarnation, I think we can Trial here and then play play a Triome tapped, and then we can go for Incarnation next turn. Have we not drawn the Incarnation? I'm not 100% sure. There's an argument for going Apparition to kill the Fable. There's an argument to go Moonblessed Cleric to try and shoot her up Incarnation, or maybe Rest in Peace. Again, I don't... I, Rest in Peace could be awful in this matchup, I really don't know. Okay, so they cycle with the Fable. Wow, they keep everything. That's a bad sign. So, uh, I mean, they almost certainly are going to have a counter spell here, I'd imagine, but... If we don't go for Incarnation, we either go for Apparition to exile the Fable, or we go Moonbless Cleric to tutor up Destiny Spinner. Maybe. I think I'm just going to Apparition the Fable, because we'd have to kill it anyway. And then... I don't know, maybe wait for them to tap out, or maybe search for a Destiny Spinner with the Cleric next turn, and then try and set up for Incarnation the following turn. Hard to say. Oh wow, Goldspan Dragon, okay. So that's potentially problematic because they still have mana up for Negate here, potentially. I think we have to just slam Incarnation here and hope that it resolves. Because if it does, we can sack the Trial of Ambition to get Renegade Rallya, get back the Trial of Ambition and then kill the Goldspan without giving them an extra treasure. Hmm, I'm just trying to think whether we want to play around Sensor or Jari Disruption, because if we do, we shock down to... 14, which is a bit scary in terms of our life total, but we basically just punt the game if they have a sensor or a dry disruption here, so I think it's probably worth playing around. Okay, so it looks like they have something, but that, that could also just be the Maze Mine Tome holding priority. Unsubstantiate, okay. So that's a little bit annoying because now they're going to go into next turn with, you know, all their lands untapped as well as the treasure that they get off Goldspan Dragon, which is quite scary. So they shock in the Sacred Foundry. Oh, okay. So they're running to Fairy now. I guess that makes sense. You know, we are playing kind of a controlly deck, so people will probably bring in Planeswalkers against us. So. I feel like I sideboarded really badly in this matchup. At least now we have a better idea of what they're playing. So we'll attack the fairy here. I won't let you win. And then I think we just have to try and resolve incarnation again. I think that's the only way we're going to win here, really. And again, I, de I obviously regret cutting Spark Hunter Masticore. Okay, they have Disdainful Stroke, so hmm. We can't really afford to shock in a land here because then we're just dead in two turns rather than three. You know, to make the most of our mana we could shock a land in and then play Urban Utopia, but then, like I said, we're, we're down to eight and then we're dead in two turns, so... Let's skip to the good part. But yeah, this game isn't looking good. I feel like... Ah, another Goldspan Dragon, okay. I don't think we're going to win this. 
But yeah, I, I feel like I sideboarded pretty badly. But that's mainly just because I didn't really know what they were playing. Okay, they have Bri Prismari Command. But at least, at least now I, I feel like I can sideboard a little bit better. So, we definitely don't want Rest in Peace then, because they can just win with Teferi and Goldspan Dragon. I've, I, I assume they'd be more all-in on combo. So we definitely want Spark Hunter Massacre, we definitely want Renegade Rallyer, we definitely want Destiny Spinner. Potentially want Redain, although we, I don't know, we didn't really see m that many expensive spells. But I think it's probably better than the second Apparition if they're playing Goldspan Dragon. We definitely want to keep at least one Apparition in to be able to tutor up off the Incarnation to deal with a Vadrock or something. But past that, I'm not sure we want any extra ones. And I, I think, yeah, I feel like I'm much happier with this setup now. So it looks like they're kind of... I don't even know if they're that combo. Maybe they just sideboarded more into a control deck because of our deck if that makes sense. Maybe it's more like a transformational sideboard. Because I assume with Vadrock you kind of need to be running other mutate cards, right? I don't know. So either way we'll flash in the omen here. Looking for more lands. Okay, we definitely want to keep the Renegade Rallyer in the deck and we'll keep a Godless Shrine. Okay, interesting. So, we can't afford, like, we would love to get Master Core into play, but we really, like, we cannot risk discarding a card to cast it and then having it countered by, like, a Sensor or bounced by a Substantiate. Unsubstantiate, I mean. Like, that's such a bad exchange for us. So, I think just putting Yorian into hand here makes sense. Okay, Destiny Spin is a nice one. So, I think, hmm, I kind of want to play Urban Utopia first, so that we then have Green Mana to play Destiny Spinner. Now, this does make Destiny Spinner counterable by Sensor or Jari Disruption, but I, do, I, I want to keep, I want to make sure I keep hitting land, so resolving Urban Utopia is pretty important here. And they need to have exactly Sensor or Jari Disruption to punish us for doing this here, so I'm I'm happy taking the risk. Just because, even though we didn't hit a land drop, I think drawing a card to try and hit our fifth land off Urban Utopia is, in some ways, as important as getting Destiny Spinner into play. Because it means we can then resolve Yorian. Okay, interesting. So they bounce the Destiny Spinner, so I have to assume they have counter spells in hand. Well, maybe not. Maybe they just don't want to get attacked as well. Interesting. So we would have loved to draw a land there, um, obviously. I think we just try Destiny Spinner again. And then I think I'm interested in playing Trial of Ambition here because I'm worried about Goldspan Dragon. And even though Trial of Ambition obviously isn't killing anything here, it at least gives us the opportunity next turn to go Incarnation, sack the Trial of Ambition, get Renegade Rallyer, to get a Trial of Ambition, so we can get Incarnation into play and kill Goldspan Dragon in the same turn. Okay, they did have it. Now, the, the one worry here with that play is unsub Unsubstantiate, because even though our spells are uncounterable, they can still bounce it off the stack with Unsubstantiate, but I still think it's worth it here, because if we don't get Incarnation in play, you know, we, we, we to play around Unsubstantiate, we'd have to go Trial of Ambition instead here, so... Ha, it looks like they have something here. Wow, it resolves, okay, that's huge. So like I said, we could have just gone Trial of Ambition instead, but I feel like their deck is trying to race, and if we don't get Incarnation in here, like if we just don't play Trial of Ambition the turn before, we're not really making use of our mana here, and we just get too far behind on tempo at that point. Whereas now, we have Incarnation in play, we get, still get to kill the Goldspan Dragon, and we have an extra 3-2 in play, so we're we're significantly further ahead. Now, like I said, they could have had an Unsubstantiate, which would have been a complete blowout, and we could have just gone Trial of Ambition instead, they could have bounced it with uns Unsubstantiate, and we could have played it again. But, I feel like we're just playing too fright, you know, we're playing, t we're playing around too much at that point, we're just playing too scared, we need to be a bit more on the front foot in this matchup, I think. 
Especially if they're still ke keeping in like the Vadrock combo side of things. So we'll lead by attacking here. And then again we have quite a few options here. Okay, they Bone Crusher Giant, the Renegade Rallyer. Interesting. So I think since they're basically tapped out here, we should just go for Yorian. Because we can Yorian, we get to draw off the Urban Utopia and the Omen of the Sea. And we still get the Incarnation activation as well. So interesting, I'm not 100% sure what to go for if Incarnation here. Probably Spellbinder, but we could also go for Glass Pool Mimic to bounce the Yorian. Hmm, interesting. I think we want another land here. We want to keep hitting land drops, but we prefer to have an untapped land if possible. So I'm kind of torn between going for Spellbinder or Glass Pool Mimic on Yorian. I just want to check to make sure what else we've got. I think I'm probably just going to go for Spellbinder here. We can always go for Glass Pool Mimic next turn. Oh wow, okay, we're definitely taking Shark Typhoon. So Destiny Spinner has put in work here. Now we see what they're holding on to. Okay, it makes sense why they unsubstantiate the Destiny Spinner now. But yeah, they need to draw pretty well to get out of this now. Especially because I can't imagine they'd be the sort of deck to be running farewell. Yeah, okay. 